So hello everyone. Uh, my name is Sudeep. I work in traffic in Facebook with Martin uh, from the kernel team in the Facebook. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the routing of the packets from the XTP layer all the way to the application socket in the traffic in Facebook. A little bit about this talk itself. Uh, you know, in LPC a few years ago, we shared how we run different uh, services powered by XTP. Um, and to this day, a lot of uh, XTP based applications like the load, load balancer and firewalls continue to power uh, traffic in Facebook. For example, every single packet process uh, coming towards Facebook has been, or still now, is processed by the uh, XTP based, a lot of these firewalls as well as uh, load balancers. And in, in, in today's talk, I want to basically start from uh, the XTP layer and uh, go into more details into some of the problems we face uh, in actually consistently and efficiently routing the packets all the way to the reverse proxies application uh, layer. Uh, specifically, I'll go into details into the two different BPF programs. Uh, one is the BPF type SKU port, and another one is BPF TCP header options. Uh, that helps us uh, simplify the problem in uh, picking the socket both within a host as well as picking the right host to route the packet. Uh, here's an overview of the overall talk. So there are two different parts to it, as I mentioned earlier. So in the part one, I'll start with what we call as zero downtime restart of the layer seven service. I'll start with the motivation and describe what that is. Some of the problems with our existing approach. And uh, we'll go into details into how BPF SKU support help us uh, solve those problems and uh, help us realize a lot of efficiency and operational wins. And then on the part two of this talk, we'll go into the details on some of the uh, mechanism used by uh, the, the layer four load balancer to pick the backend host, which is based off of the consistent hashing, some of the problems that we face uh, with today's approach, and how we are able to actually solve that problem by embedding the routing information in the TCP packet itself using BPF TCP header options. Before I begin, I just want to provide a brief overview of the, the, the traffic architecture in Facebook. So we have uh, two tiers here. One is the edge tiers, which um, are around the world, and we have data centers. In both edge as well as in the data centers, which we also call origin, um, there are both the layer four as well as the layer seven load balancers. And there's a uh, long-lived connections, typically long-lived connections from edge to the origin via backbone. Um, as you can expect, pretty much all the user connections terminate as, at the edge. And uh, both in edge and origin, there is a layer four load balancer, which basically load balances the incoming via bound traffic to the individual uh, layer seven host. And uh, the layer seven uh, service basically load balances at the end in the origin to the individual uh, servers such as HSVM or you know, many other different uh, applications. Okay, now let's go into the uh, part one of the talk, which is uh, which involves more in how do we route packets within a host, um, in other words, with the zero downtime restart. And in this uh, part, I'm going to be focused more within the layer seven aspect, both in the edge and the origin. Uh, before I begin, I just wanna point out that we have uh, described the overall process in detail in the SICOM uh, paper in the last year SICOM. So for those of you who wanna, uh, who are interested in more details to uh, figure out what the actual uh, implementation level details are, uh, you can go and read that paper as well. So, okay. So if we, uh, whenever we wanna restart a service, right? Like in this case, let's say uh, layer seven reverse proxy, a very uh, traditional approach to restart the service involves something like, um, so at a given time, you have some number of, uh, existing connections and uh, each of the hosts is also accepting new connections, right? And then when you want to, let's say in this case, let's say we pick a, a proxy on one to restart that, uh, then uh, it involves something like a, a graceful downtime, sorry, graceful shutdown period where it stops taking any new traffic, but at the same time, it is serving the existing traffic so that the existing traffic has uh, existing connections have chance to uh, terminate gracefully uh, 
organically uh, so that we avoid any kind of like spikes in the user uh, visible errors, uh, for example, because of the TCP reset. Usually this is achieved via uh, failing the health check from the downstream service. Like for example, in this case, we would basically have a mechanism where this particular host would fail the health check coming from the Catran. And after a, a period of time for the graceful shutdown period, which can usually be in like order of minutes, like you know five minutes or 10 minutes depends on the application, then it stops actually to accept any new traffic as well. After which uh, you'd go and deploy the new code there. So you terminate the existing process and you spin the new process with the updated code. And after a period of time, the, 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 uh, the number of connections starts to ramp up and you have the uh, new updated process that is actually taking the same level of connection that was before. So far, so good. Uh, it works. It's been used by many organizations and services. So what's the problem with it? One problem is that when you are actually doing the, the deployment, you are at a reduced capacity. And it really depends on how you have configured it. But at the end of the day, the time period, including from the graceful uh, shutdown period all the way to the time when you have actually spawned the new process, that is the time when you are not actually serving uh, the maximum number of connections that you actually could be serving. So you are at a reduced capacity. I mentioned CPU here, but it could be memory or network or any other resource bottleneck that you may actually have. And this is one of the reasons why a lot of the uh, organizations basically avoid deploying at the peak time. Um, for example, you may have to wake up, you know, at Sunday morning at 5 a.m. to actually do the deployment of your service. Um, now, the flip side of this argument is that, well, you could basically uh, expand the number of phases you uh, need to actually deploy. So there is not any effective heat in the capacity, but it takes forever to deploy, right? For example, if you have 100 hosts, you could basically update one host at a time and do the update in 100 phases, but it's gonna take 100 phases. So, you know, if the, uh, the graceful time that you have is, let's say, 10 minutes, then it's gonna take 1,000 minutes, which is um, a long time. And it's basically not gonna scale if you have a lot of, uh, lot of services, a lot of hosts, et cetera. So then that brings us to the question like, okay, how can we actually do uh, this kind of update without actually impacting the user traffic? Uh, without you know sending reset uh, to them every time we do the deployment, without losing capacity, and still being able to iterate um, at a very uh, high velocity. So this is when we introduce what we call the zero downtime restart, or in other words, socket takeover. Again, the details of this mechanism are in the paper, but I'm just gonna go over it uh, briefly. So instead of waiting for the existing process to sit down completely, Essentially what we do is we spin another process in parallel, and then we pass the file descriptors of the listening TCP socket as well as the UDP sockets uh, via a local Unix socket and pass the STM writes. This process works reasonably well for TCP, but there is a problem for UDP-based traffic, especially the ones that actually have maintained uh, connection state. Uh, which is the case for Quick. For those of you who are not familiar, Quick is an application web protocol based off of UDP. So Kernel doesn't have any context about Quick itself. Everything is maintained in the application layer. So when we have two different processes running in parallel, then while during that phase, there is no way for the application level to a layer to know where the packet for a, an existing connection is gonna end up in. It could either end up in one process versus the other process, because there is no such thing as like, listening socket or accepting socket for, for TCP, sorry, for Quake, like it has for TCP. That's why it's not a big problem for TCP. There are some caveats actually. Um, on, on Monday, Kuniyuki actually uh, mentioned some of those problems, but even if we ignore those, this is a big problem for uh, UDP-based applications. So to solve this, we essentially implemented a solution in the user space where uh, the new process would basically look up the packet look up some, some uh, like metadata, for example, in the case of Quick, there is what's called a connection ID in the specification itself. And based on that, it would basically forward, the, uh, make the determination on which process or which worker owned an incoming packet and make that decision to actually forward to another process via another local socket. Um, so the overall process from like start to finish, 
looks very complicated because you know there's a lot of the interprocess communication involved. Uh, there's just too many states involved uh, in 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 getting this thing over uh, right from start to finish. So if we kind of take a step back and sort of look at this uh, socket takeover process, then a it's like very complex and fragile process as I just mentioned. There's uh, a lot of the interprocess communication involved, which got worse. Uh, when we had to support UDP-based uh, applications like Quake. For example, if any one of the process crashes, in addition to the spikes in the user level errors, you would also um, end up in a state where it is very hard to recover from. There are also very, uh, there are also known edge cases that would lead in the leaking of the socket file descriptors when it's passed from one process to another. So there are a lot of uh, potential vulnerabilities and, and uh, paths for outages. So at the end of the day, if we really think about oh, what, what is the fundamental problem here, then uh, it, it comes from the fact that we're trying to share the same socket between two different processes without having to create new one. So um, then we got into thinking like, okay, how can we avoid sharing this kind of, uh, avoid this kind of mechanism that has uh, forced us to share the same socket between multiple processes? That kind of uh, naturally lends to this discussion with Azure Use Port, um, where uh, sure, with Azure Use Port, then you don't actually need to share the sockets. You can pretty much spin parallel processes and use Azure Use Port when binding to the socket address. But then the problem with that is, again, for UDP, we end up in a state where when there are multiple processes running, then the packet for an existing connection could end up in any worker or any process. Uh, this is even ignoring some of the problems with SRU support that Kuni Yuki mentioned on Monday. Now, the flip side of that argument is that, okay, what if you don't use SRU support, right, for UDP? Then, um, again, the, the, we run into problem with UDP again, because for TCP, the, the, the single thread that accepts the connection just need to accept the connection and hand over the file descriptor to another thread, which is a very typical setup in a lot of the load balancers. Uh, but then for UDP, again, like kernel is on a multiplex or because kernel has no idea whether it's like a, a new packet or uh, like there is no TCP scenic variant for UDP, right? Everything is in application state. So it's gonna basically multiplex the packet at packet level. So the, the one thread which is listening to the UDP socket is gonna to have to multiply not just the TCP scenic equivalent, but all the packets. So that basically effectively leads into a bottleneck of a single thread, uh, which has to basically process all the packets, which clearly did not scale well for us. So um, the, the main key question here is that if we could keep the, somehow control the routing of the uh, packets within a host, then we could basically not have to do this. We could bind with SRU support in parallel and solve our scaling problem. So that's when um, we started to think about how, what if we could use a BPF at the socket level? And this is where we introduced the socket level load balancer, SKLV insert. So with the BPF SKLV support, um, we could basically handle generic, uh, any protocol right in the implementation. So the idea is that with each socket family, like let's say the colon port for a socket address, we'd attach the BPF program. And within the implementation of the BPF program, we could handle the routing of the packets for TCP. We could handle the routing of the packets for quick, which is a more like application level protocol. We could also handle any like non quick generic UDP uh, because we can basically pick any socket uh, from within that layer. This also allows us better control on the startup process. Like for example, it's very typical that any reverse proxy, when it's starting up, it has a lot of state to initialize. It is also very common for the reverse proxy to uh, go and start like health checking of its pool, et cetera, right? So there's, a, there's quite some time before it's actually, even if it had actually bind to the socket, uh, it's not actually ready to process the incoming packet because there's a lot of uh, initialization happening. So we don't have to worry about that phase because the application level can dictate when it is actually ready to accept uh, traffic for on the new process. Meanwhile, the BPF program can send the existing uh, or any new packet to the old process that's still running. Uh, it can 
address our scaling concern. Uh, for example, the one that I just mentioned earlier with the single threaded uh, acceptor for all the UDP packets, because we can then bind with a use port and use multiple workers in parallel. Um, to go a little bit more a uh, step forward, this also enables us a generic like a load balancer uh, type uh, framework. Like for example, it's very typical for any kind of load balancer to employ uh, or enable or offer uh, algorithms such as weighted routing so that you can target more load on certain uh, hosts versus others. So in a similar fashion, we can also target more, C more um, packets towards some CPU versus uh, others. For example, this can be appealing if you run in a multi-tenant environment where you have multiple containers and they have like uneven distribution of the CPU utilization where some subset of course may be harder than the others. So you can basically target the ones that have more CPU headroom than the others. Uh, this framework can also, also offers more uh, ways to actually experiment further. For example, uh, this is still in experiment phase. We don't have any real data on this, but uh, you can basically try to experiment where the, the packet or SKBF buff stays in the same uh, CPU or the NUMA, NUMA domain from ingress to egress. Because you can, again, you have control over where you want to send the packet to. Uh, going back to the, uh, the problem that I mentioned earlier, where uh, there was no way when the two processes were alive for the kernel to, for the application to determine where the packet will end up. Now with the BPF, then we can basically put in logic so that even when the new process comes up, the, all the packets keep going to the old process. And finally, when the new process is ready, then it can update the BPF map uh, to basically tell the BPF program that, hey, I'm ready to actually accept packets for these addresses and so on. Uh, the, the API for the BPF SKS electric support offers the SRU support array, which is the array of file descriptors of the sockets for the socket family. And you can pick the index in that array to pick where to route the packet to. So basically the array dictates which process to send the packet to versus the index can dictate which socket you wanna send the packet to. So uh, I mentioned earlier on, you can use this to basically target more load to certain set of CPUs. So if you basically, for example, pin a thread that owns a socket to an individual core, then you can um, you, like implement some weighted algorithm just before picking this index to target more load to some index versus others. Uh, in terms of the implementation level detail, uh, at the very uh, core of the implementation is like a BPF HACCP map, which maintains the VIP uh, address port as the key, and the value is the, as I mentioned earlier, is the uh, SRU port SOC array, which has the index of the, uh, the file descriptors. I did not mention, like one of the problems that I mentioned earlier was, we still wanna be able to keep the packets for existing UDP connections to the old process or the individual worker in the old process, um, but that can be achieved very easy with, uh, easily with uh, LRU has map where key is the five tuple of uh, source and destination and uh, source IP is destination IP source port destination port and you can just look up if the BPF program has already seen the uh, flow or seen the uh, packet for this flow in that case then it can just simply pick up the FD by looking it up and route the packet to that particular uh, socket um, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, by just updating this particular map, then the new process, sorry, the BPF program can route the packet to the new process. Uh, this solved our scaling concern, uh, specifically now that we can dictate how to route the packet uh, from the application level, then uh, we don't really have to worry about the ambiguity to process. So as a result, we can basically accept the pa packets in parallel without having to worry about the disruptions or misrouting or packet drops when the uh, process were restarting. Uh, just to show you the effect after we made the change, um, in this graph, I have um, one graph that shows the percentage of servers in a production tier that were being updated. And there's another graph uh, which shows the number of packets dropped. Basically, when we 
uh, restarted the entire tier, there was no visible change in the uh, amount of packets dropped while the process was in place. I mentioned about we got rid of our scaling uh, bottleneck. So in this graph, um, I had uh, two sets of hosts. One is the test and one is the control. And I increased the, the load targeted to those hosts, starting from load factor of one, two X, three X, et cetera. Um, on the control host, basically at around like three times the load, he was not able to process any more packets without dropping a huge portion of them. So it basically maxed out at, at three X the load versus on the control host, which, sorry, on the test host, which was running the SKLB, I was able to uh, ramp up the load to all the way to 30X. And at that point, basically it was running out of CPU. Um, and even then it was throwing less errors than it was with the control hosts. Just to recap, um, by just employing a fairly straightforward implementation uh, with the PPF SKL use port and SOL use port soccer, it was, uh, able to simplify our overall process and provide us with huge operational wins. There is like no more, a lot of the inter-process communication going on to orchestrate the whole process, which means there's overall less failures than uh, now than we used to see before. Um, got rid of our uh, scaling bottleneck with the single thread and also got rid um, of some of the corner cases that led to the drops of the UDB packets. Uh, I didn't even mention the three-way, uh, like potential race with the three-way handshake during the TCP connection establishment, which is similar to the problem I described about UDP because during the uh, TCP scene, the scene act um, could, sorry, the, 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 the response after the scene act could end up in a whole different process. It's the same problem. So um, we got rid of that uh, edge case as well. So um, overall, it was a big win for us at Apron no costs other than just the implementation part as well. I do wanna share just one experience of deploying this. Um, when we started to deploy this in products and we saw large spikes in CPU when we had these both processes running in parallel, which was very surprising because we hadn't actually seen that issue manifest in our test. And there was no reason to believe that it was gonna um, there was like nothing in the implementation itself that uh, led us to believe uh, which would lead in the large CPU consumption. So um, after debugging further, turns out the issue has nothing to do with the BPF itself, but more to do with the fact that uh, there were multiple sockets um, within the same uh, network namespace, which were bound both with and without SOD support. Um, there's an implementation of the bind which basically takes the spin lock to walk along the, the hash table to find if there is a conflict. But the key of the hash table is just the port. So if you have a large number of HTTP endpoints, then the key is gonna be largely 443 or uh, 80 in some cases. And that was problematic because we basically had exactly that. And this was uh, uh, this resulted in like uh, large spikes in CPU and even the host uh, locking and took us a long time to actually debug. So we're just saying, just in case someone else have a similar issue, especially if you run multi-tenant environment where a lot of the containers are, you know, for example, run by different teams and you don't necessarily coordinate with all these uh, socket options that are being applied. So one workaround we came up with was, okay, let's just make sure that in the very early phase of the container, we'll just bind the wild card for for three, so that nothing else could actually successfully bind without SOCD support. So this was a way to actually force everybody uh, to bind with SOCD support or just uh, crash their application. Even then we ran into another bug, which has now since been fixed, where, uh, for example, in this particular example, if you bind with the specific address one and two, uh, then the third bind should have failed because it's more generic but it was not actually failing. So there was basically an implementation um, bug in terms of how the, the address were cast in the data structure. So even though it's now been fixed, when we were actually deploying, we had to basically make sure that all the um, sockets were cleared in that host before we were able to deploy this safely and then actually bind with the wildcard for, for three so that nobody else could actually bind. Um, one more thing, um, the BPF SK select release board looks quite similar in some ways to BPF SK lookup. So I just wanted to 
briefly mention some comparisons. And they both seem to have similar motivation. Uh, there's actually a lot more detail uh, in this really great paper uh, which came out in uh, last month's CICOM. So you can definitely follow a lot more uh, in details in that paper itself. And I'm sure Jakob uh, from Cloudflare can provide a lot more details about the BPF Haskell lookup. But I just wanted to mention that there is some more motivation in that uh, they both kind of stem from this uh, limitation or lack of any control from the application layer to dictate where uh, to dictate where which socket is picked by the kernel for an incoming packet. There is one, um, at least one difference in the sense that SK select reuse port is actually very much tightly coupled with the address of the socket family it's bound to, versus SK lookup on the other hand um, seems to be aimed towards uh, decoupling the, the socket from the IP address itself and needs to pick any uh, socket within the network namespace. And uh, now I can go into the part two, but Probably this is a good time to pause for a question if there is any. Let me wait for one minute. Yeah, sounds good. Um, please pick up and unmute yourself if anyone has questions, comments, feedback to the previous slides. All right, uh, in that case, I can go ahead with the part two. So in the part one, we focus on picking of sockets inside a host. Now in the part two, I'm gonna focus on picking of uh, individual host from L4 to L7. So going back to the overall architecture diagram that I showed earlier, in this part, I'm going to be focused within this space between uh, layer four load balancer to layer seven load balancer within the data center. So just a little bit of a, an overview of the details of the layer four load balancer that we employ in Facebook. Uh, it is based off of the open source, uh, now open sourced uh, XCP based. Sorry, I think there's a question. Um, let me see. All right, I think that's a, that's a comment. All right, <laughs> never mind. Uh, let me go with the uh, part two and then I can uh, also answer any questions about part one uh, at the end. So, yeah, so the outload layer four load balancer is based of XTP and the implementation is open source called Catran. Uh, at the very uh, heart of it, it employs the consistent hashing implementation to pick any backend uh, L7 host uh, based off of the maglev hash. On top of the consistent hashing, it also has a mechanism to locally track the connection for resiliency against any changes in the backend server. For example, some servers could be down for maintenance, etc. So to avoid the ring changes, uh, it has a local cache of connections to uh, look up without doing the hash. So here's a very four line summary of overall uh, mechanism to pick an end host for an incoming packet. So for a packet, if it is in the local cache, it just returns that, otherwise it employs the hash mod ring. It is very, very efficient and effective. So what's the problem with that? Uh, this particular graph is from the maglev paper itself. So this graph shows for two different sizes of the ring, uh, the changes in the ring itself when the, uh, with the, uh, on the x-axis is the percentage of the failed backends. So even though uh, the, the summary is that even though the, the change in, or the probability of misrouting on a change in the backend itself is quite low, there are still non-zero chances of misrouting when that happens. And it works very well for short-lived connections, which is typically the case for a lot of HTTP-based uh, application. But it is problematic when you have to support a very long-lived TCP connections. For example, like video streams that go on for multiple hours, or you know, sport broad broadcasting and so on. So going back to that uh, overview of the implementation that we employ inside Katran, the first part, to look up if uh, in the local cache doesn't work if there is a there is an ECMP shuffle which results in the packets for an existing flow go to a different Catran host than it used to. So which is going to then result in cache miss. And meanwhile, if there is also a ring change, 
at the same time, then there's a small chance that it's going to send the packet to a whole different host. So in some ways, uh, usually continuous release or more frequent release of all the tiers is generally a good idea. But then if we do too much, then it actually hurts the overall reliability of the connection. Um, and in addition to the release, you know, like things like maintenance, especially when you have like lots of servers, things like maintenance happen all the time. So the change in the ring is more of a norm than exception. Uh, and in that case, anytime there is an ECMP shuffle, you're gonna hurt um, the active connections. Uh, even though it's a small amount, it does pull down the overall reliability metric. One way to solve, is, uh, solve this problem is, well, you can, you can share the local cache among all the hosts, but sharing the cache across multiple hosts really sucks because then you have to address a whole new class of distributed system problem. And especially in this, uh, very fast data path, uh, you want to be as much efficient as possible. And uh, doing RPC call in this phase is, is usually not feasible. I specifically mentioned this was a problem only for Quick, sorry, only for TCP and not for Quick. Uh, we in Facebook do use a lot of Quick. Uh, it's because in Quick, uh, there is something in the specification itself that allows servers to actually embed routing information in the Quick packet itself. So for those of you who are not familiar, uh, Quick specification has a notion called connection ID, and servers can embed any arbitrary information in the connection ID, and clients must echo that information back. So this basically enables servers to embed some routing information in the ID, which clients will echo back later on. And the cut run in the middle can just look up that fixed offset and extract the routing information just from the packet itself without having to do any kind of hashing or cache lookup, et cetera. Well, can we do the same for TCP? So that's when uh, we started to think about, well, can we leverage the BPF TCP header option that Martin added to embed similar information in the TCP packet itself? Turns out the answer is yes. Um, so the overall idea is that uh, we, we leverage the SOCOPS program attached to the C group. And you get callbacks on events such as listen, connect, connection established on the client side or basically on the each endpoint, active side or passive side. And within this implementation of these callbacks, you can either write this uh, routing information. In this case, we just need an ID of the server, if you are a server, or you can just read the uh, server ID in the packet and extract that routing information and store it for subsequent use later on. So here's what it looks like in the uh, overall execution in the data path. So again, going back to that um, overall architecture diagram, uh, we have the L7 in the A's, proxies in the A's, uh, cut run in the middle, which is the layer full load balancer. And again, uh, proxies is the server side, in this case, on the data centers. We attach the BPF program on both sides. So let's, let's go with a uh, flow. Um, there's a SYN packet coming from the proxy zone on one side. Then cut run is gonna apply consistent hash because it has not seen this connection before. Now the server is gonna, in addition to you know, respond by, uh, to SYNAC, what it's gonna do is it's gonna look up its own ID and write that ID in the packet, uh, which in this case is SYNAC. Now let's assume that while this is in progress, the cut run host that was that had the context about this particular connection went offline. And also some of the L7 hosts also went offline for various reasons. So this is gonna lead into both the server ring chains as well as the ECMP shuffle because now all the flows that was owned by the, the, the host that just went offline is gonna be routed to some other cut run instances. So going back to that uh, flow, now on the client side, it's gonna look up the packet that it just received, try to parse the TCP header and uh, extract the server ID and store the server ID in the SK storage. And then it's gonna basically, on all the subsequent packet, it's gonna embed that server ID in the TCP packet header itself. Now let's see what happens. So the, as I mentioned earlier, this now packet um, for the existing connection is gonna be routed to a different cut run host because the one uh, that had the context went offline. Uh, 
Um, but it doesn't have to do anything other than just extract the server ID from the packet itself. Then it's going to reverse look up the server ID and then just route to the host that actually owns this connection. So as a result of this, we avoided any potential misrouting of this packet, which have led to the TCP reset instantly. Overall, um, the, the overhead in the data path is basically just six bytes, where the first two bytes um, tell about the kind and length of this packet header, and then we basically resolve four bytes for the server ID. We didn't really, we didn't see any measurable difference in the runtime overhead from the parsing of the uh, server ID in the layer four, but that is an overhead. In terms of implementation level detail, uh, for those of you who are not familiar, the suck ups, you can get connect a lot of the uh, callbacks on a lot of these events, um, depending on the like the C groups that you're attached to. Uh, in this case, we, we use these uh, callbacks that I mentioned here. Um, in the case of server side, it's gonna just uh, store the control plane of the uh, load balancer is gonna store the server ID in the beginning in then offline fashion. Then every time there is a connect, then it's gonna embed uh, and subscribe to the right header option on the server side. Likewise, on the client side, every time there's a connection established, it's gonna try to parse the header option. And if there is a server ID, then it's gonna store that server ID in the SK storage so that on the subsequent packet write, it can just embed that information. So overall, the implementation is quite straightforward. Um, now, I, I left out the part which involves how do we basically assign the routing information, the server ID, and make sure that both uh, layer four and layer seven have the same view. Uh, there is an offline workflow that uh, just assigns arbitrary ID to each one of the active hosts uh, in the layer seven and uh, propagates that masses to both uh, layer four as well as the layer seven surface. Again, this is also another fairly straightforward component uh, doesn't have any like extra overhead or anything uh, in the uh, in terms of maintainability, and then the control plane of the these both load balancers makes sure that they are kept in sync and uh, periodically refreshed in the data plane. And uh, we because we employ the similar mechanism for both quick and TCP, we're able to leverage the same pipeline for both of them. Um, as a result, after we deployed this. Uh, this is a graph from the production from one application that has a really long lived connections. We're basically able to get rid of pretty much all the um, the background noise, in other words, of the TCP uh, or the uh, connection error coming from the connection resets, which definitely makes a big improvement in terms of the overall reliability of the application itself. It does have a limitation, however. Um, it is only feasible if you control both endpoints. Uh, so it is only uh, useful in a typical data center environment where you control both both sides. Uh, for example, it would be great if we could also uh, make uh, it work from the clients outside of our control, but they are not going to echo back the server ID uh, that the server sent. Uh, also, even if they did, I'm pretty sure a lot of the middle boxes and firewalls would probably drop it anyway. I haven't tried it, but uh, it's practically infeasible if you could do not control both endpoints. Um, just in terms of the recap, uh, we're able to embed the server ID in the TCP header for state stateless routing. It doesn't really require any uh, maintaining of any state in the layer four host. Uh, we didn't really see any uh, tangible cost in terms of like CPU or memory, memory overhead, both in layer four as well as the layer seven side the alternatives of these are uh, quite complex a you either need to share this state between the among all the layer 4 hosts which has a lot of the downside i think there have been some attempts in the past which try to use some other unused uh, uh, like header options or other fields in the tcp header like ecr or timestamp uh, that also has a lot of uh, downside in terms of um, all the pieces necessary to pull together to actually make sure that you reserve like for example last few bytes in the timestamp and then uh, not all the clients actually echo it back etc so a lot of these have downsides and uh, and a lot of maintainability costs which we're able to avoid uh, 
by just using the uh, TCP header option uh, using the BPF. And that is pretty much all I have. Uh, let me know if you have questions. Awesome, thanks a lot for the talk. So Thank anyone with questions or uh, feedback, please uh, speak up now. Hello, it's me again. Uh, thank you for this talk. It was really enjoyable. Um, and I kind of I had it, I had some deja vu because I think the problems that you that you solved are very similar to what uh, we have been solving as well. So it's really interesting to see. I think your TCP header option is really cool. Um, makes a ton of sense. Um, with with being able to co control both client and server is also cool. So uh, thank you very much. That was enlightening. Um, I was wondering, uh, we, we looked at Katran years ago, and there was some, I think we were always a bit confused where I think somehow we got the notion that Katran has a somewhat consistent connection tracking view, I guess, of a colo or something bigger than that. But from what you said, that's not actually true. So maybe you could. Uh, yeah, so Katran has this. Uh, for the connection tracking, it is very local to itself. So that's why if there is an ECMP reshuffle and uh, the packets go to a different Catron, then it's gonna know anything about that connection. So it's gonna basically fall back to the constant hashing. And in that case, which again, like works most of the time, but if the server ring has changed, then there's a small chance that it's gonna pick a different server. So if you have enough of those connections, then it's gonna show up in your reliability metric, which was the case for us. Yeah, overall, I think uh, the, the the biggest win has been the overall uh, the simplified process as a result of this, especially with the zero downtime reset, there were a lot of very complex pieces, which we were just able to get rid of that and and just have like one layer to dictate the overall process uh, regarding the part one. I was, I was wondering on the consistent hashing note, um... So you, you do have this upper guarantee of, let's say, where you can say, okay, at, at most 1% of uh, backends should change if, um, for the consistent hashing. Uh, like what, uh, so like what's, what's your experience from practice? What would be like a good upper bound in, in, in terms of changing backends? Yeah, I, but the, the problem here is that we cannot, uh, I think one way to answer that question is that like how many, can we limit the number of changes of the backends at a given time? And that's, that's hard to control in a kind of like a large system where multiple teams have different responsibilities and they kind of independently update their services. Uh, so a lot of these kind of tend to be in batches where, you know, you may have some maintenance event which is taking off, you know, a, a large chunk of the production host offline. And in that case, you see like huge spikes in the, in the error rates and so on. That's been our experience basically. So on a, on a steady state, it's not a big problem, but when these kind of events happen in batches, then you see more pain on top of those maintenance events. Right, well, I'm happy to answer questions, follow through the questions in the chat as well, if you have any questions. Uh,